How's it going, everybody? Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sunday, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern, Saturday mornings with Jim Valley, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 Eastern, Sundays with Andrew Zarian, and it is Monday here on this show. Hey, you know what that means? Well, it means we got a lot to talk about. Tonight is Monday Night Raw, and we've got a jam-packed lineup for the show coming up here today. I think uh, six segments announced thus far. NXT tomorrow. AW Dynamite on Wednesday. Got an NXT stand to deliver coming up. WrestleMania night one and two. Wendy City Riot. And plenty more. But when we get started here today, yes, we will talk about the Jack Perry situation. Which uh, came up this weekend. And uh, I did my best to try to make it. Simple and easy for everybody to understand. And as it turns out, I suck at my job. I have no other. Or or people suck at reading. Or a little of both. But we've also got an update on Alex Coglin, who has retired. Some WrestleMania notes, including when WrestleMania, or when Becky Lynch wants to wrestle on WrestleMania. Which actually is, uh, you know, it's not really a story, but it does tell you about the mindset of a lot of wrestlers. Not just her, but many others. We've got notes on the collision schedule. There are going to be some preemptions coming up. Ronda Rousey, more burials of Vince McMahon. We've got a King of Pro Wrestling match with the Great O'Conn and uh, and Tangaloa. They're going to be having a match coming up. And we're going to tell you what the special stipulations are. Slammy Awards are coming. You want to guess who's going to win the Slammies? A Vince McMahon-free Slammy Awards. So uh, I think we might actually be able to pick most of the winners here. SmackDown Report, obviously no Rampage or Collision, which like an idiot I forgot about the other night when I couldn't find him on my YouTube TV and was getting furious. But anyway, a lot to get into today. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Tony Storm, joined by Mariah May and Luther. The panic is over, I'm here. Hello, beautiful. Hello, it's great to see you. Mr. Khan. Great to see you, I'm Jim. getting all tangled. I can't do this. Luther. Luther, right? I'm stuck. This is great. It's Just perfect. Doing nothing. Fantastic. Totally. I know. It is so nice to see it's you. It's great to see you, champ. So proud of you. Thank, Thank you. I'm so proud of you. I can't remember the reason why, but I am. Thank you. Yes. Congratulations. You know what? We should start these a little later and go on even longer. Oh. And that way we can all have breakfast. <laughs> That's great. Think? Sounds great. I have an 8 a.m. in Palm Beach, so I'm gonna. It's gonna be a long one, but we're good. Tony Storm, congratulations on retaining your title tonight. How how are you feeling after this match with Deanna Perrazzo? Shit, Renee. If you must know, but let's get to the important business. So, since all your questions often amount often amount to a fair amount of yellow communist journalism, I've prepared a statement of my own. That way, you won't have to announce which website. You work for us like a point of pride, so... <coughs> Excuse me. Good evening. I am still your AEW Women's World Champion. But I couldn't have done it without the following people. Thank you to the city of Greensboro for keeping the riffraff out of the hotel lobby. Best wishes and happy retirement to Sting. Seems like just yesterday we started on this journey together. Feel free to use my summer house in Martha's Vineyard. <clears throat> I would like to thank my protege, Mariah May, for capturing the unpolished beauty of my youth. I see something in you. I don't know what it is, but I do. I am giving you full access to my old storage unit. Help yourself. <laughs> Ah, uh, of course, uh, to my trusted servant, servant Luther. Yes, um, I'll have a salmon nori roll, carbonated water, and Pepto Bismol. Right chop, away, chop. Madame. Thank you, dear. <sighs> Thank you to official Aubrey Edwards for making the right decision. But next time, please wear milder perfume, if you could. I have a bit of a headache. I would like to thank the commentators, Mr. Tasmaniac and Sean Excalibur Mooney for their usual East Coast, West Coast analytical banter. Ah, and the utmost respect for my opponent and former friend Diana Perrazzo, 
a great showing. A great showing. You took me to the limit. You brought out the best in me. And blah, 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 blah. I hope you go back to impact. <laughs> I tell you what, my arms are killing me. I don't know how I'm going to do my usual debauchery tonight. I am going to have to open that gift bag that Karen Jarrett got for me. If you understand what I mean. Back on the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. It's been a while since I spoke to y'all, but here I am again. How's it been going? Oh, it's been great. Oh, really? Yeah. So anyway, uh, Friday, Friday's the day I know to do the show. Mm -hmm. It's also the day that the Observer comes out. And, uh, and it's also the day that I, I, that's my day to spend with Hanalei and take her to gymnastics and all sorts of fun stuff. And I, uh, what a day that ended up being. Not what I expected. So I guess we'll start at the beginning. The new Observer came out, and there was a blurb about the Jungle Boy. And uh, here's what it said. I'll just read the, the part here at the end. Regarding Jack Perry, who's never been gone for seven months since the incident with CM Punk at Wembley, people thinking he's been fired. He is still under contract. Obviously, he's working only for New Japan. He then says that Tony's never answered any questions regarding him. The way we heard it, Dave said, is that he was sent home after Wembley, never heard back from Khan. He apologized, kept texting him about how he never meant to cause any trouble and was sorry. He did hear from the company through lawyers. Then they talked, and he apologized to Khan, but he still has not been brought back. What they are doing now in Japan is storyline to lead to an eventual return. So that was what was in the Observer. And... Early in the morning, turns out that Jack Perry was not happy with that report. And a lot of stuff happened. And I ended up writing a story for the front page to try to clear up what he was unhappy about. Because he didn't say the entire thing was untrue. Like, later in the day, it was like, oh, you know, Dave reported one thing and Brian reported the exact opposite. Uh, but the uh, website is cr... There was one thing that Jungle Boy Jack Perry greatly disputed, and that was that he apologized, kept texting, said he never meant to cause any trouble, was sorry, and later apologized to Tony Khan. He was very upset about that because he insists that that never happened, and he did not like that characterization that he was repeatedly texting, saying he was sorry, asking for forgiveness, etc. So this is the story that I wrote. And I want everyone to know, I rewrote this story like six times because I wanted this to be so simple. I used short sentences. I used small words. I was like, could I make this any easier to understand? And it's not even a lot of words. Sonny O'Mara would have been fine with this report. And he did not like too many words. Jack Perry both disputes the claim that he continually apologized or asked forgiveness in the months following his backstage fight with CM Punk at last August AEW All-In, or that there are any current plans for an AEW return. According to Perry, he did not hear from AEW head Tony Khan for two months following All-In at London's Wembley Stadium. Perry said he never texted to say he was sorry. He told Khan's lawyers he would not initiate first contact. Khan finally set up an in-person meeting before full gear in Los Angeles, where they discussed plans to bring him back last December. However, after CM Punk returned to WWE at Survivor Series, those plans were scrapped. Perry, who had wanted to work Wrestle Kingdom, but was unable to for logistical reasons, then worked with Rocky Romero and Khan to set up his current New Japan run. At this point, Perry is still under AEW contract. He asked for his release but was denied. But there are still no plans to bring him back. He hasn't talked to Tony Khan in months. 
Not cleared anything he has done in storyline for New Japan, like him tearing up the AW contract or his usage of the term scapegoat. That was the entire story, okay? I thought that was pretty easy to understand. So the first thing that came out was, I would say that actually probably about half the people that that read it and responded, you know, they understood what his issue was, and they understood what the story was. The other half, I don't know what it is, dude. I don't know what it is. The one that was like the most insane to me was the people that said, so now we're doing storyline articles. Now we're writing an article to further his storyline in New Japan. And I was like, how in God's name could you read that article and conclude that he was playing into a storyline or that I was helping to further a storyline in New Japan? If he was trying to further his storyline then he would have said, I tore up that contract and I am no longer a part of AEW. If he would have been furthering a storyline, he would have made it clear that Rocky and I got together to get me into New Japan. Now, what was written, very specifically, in short sentences, was that Tony Khan and Rocky Romero set up his New Japan run. It was made very clear in this article that they spoke and they are on the same page regarding going to New Japan. Now, the other thing that I can't figure out is how people can't understand that Jack Perry, because, you know, Dave talked about how Tony was still upset about the CM Punk thing. And they're like, oh, well, you know, this disputes that. No, it doesn't dispute that. Because, and this has happened many times. This is not unusual. Jack Perry got suspended, and he didn't hear one word from Tony Khan for months. This is not unusual. The same thing happened with Kenny Omega. The same thing happened with the Young Bucks. The same thing happened with everybody that has had a disciplinary issue in AEW. Everything just goes silent. Okay? Obviously, for whatever reason, and I don't know the reason, they had decided there was going to be a return. And when CM Punk showed up at Survivor Series, Tony decided it ain't happening. Why? I don't know. And Tony's not going to explain why. It could be that he thought, you know what? Punk's showing up. If I bring back Jungle Boy right now, it looks like a retaliation shot. I just don't want to do it right now. And so that way, I don't know why, okay? But that's possible. So I don't understand how people can't figure out that Jack can be upset and bitter about what happened post-Wembley. Tony Khan can be upset about what happened with Jack Perry and CM Punk. But despite these feelings, they can still work together. And the irony, which is just its amazing to me, is when what happened with CM Punk and the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega happened, and the Young Bucks wanted nothing to do with CM Punk, what did everybody say? Why can't they just put their differences aside and work together for business? Well... Here we are in literally the exact same situation. There was something involving CM Punk, and Jack Perry and Tony Khan are upset with each other about what happened. They're upset about the circumstances, but they are willing to work together for business. Why is all of a sudden that, oh, he must be furthering an angle? They're they're actually doing what everybody begged CM Punk and the Young Bucks to do, but now it's like, oh, that can't possibly happen. They can't possibly have this situation worked out where Jack goes to New Japan, he does some angles or whatever. Uh, You know, they they either have to be in love with each other, or if they don't like each other, they can't possibly... No. There can be hard feelings, but both sides are willing to work together, and that's where we are right now. So, if there's any other questions I can answer, I'd be happy to. But literally nothing I wrote isn't something that hasn't happened before in AEW. 
I mean, everything is exactly, it is a glimpse into how things work in disciplinary situations in AEW. There are no plans for him to return right now. I never said he wasn't ever going to return. I figure at some point he's gonna, but there are no plans right now. And he's doing what he's doing with, a, with, N, with New Japan. They're doing what they're doing without him. I'm sure some point he'll come back, but that's where everything is right now. Have any questions? What did I miss? I don't. I think you covered everything there. Just flabbergasted. Why? The threat on our board was like astonishing. There are still people trying to figure out if the Young Bucks and Cody Rhodes hate each other. No, the Young so. Bucks and Cody Rhodes are friends with each other. I know, but and hey, do you think no. that you know you think hey. with Cody and the Bucks friends with each other that CM Punk is like Cody's favorite person? No, but he's going to work with the guy. He'll work with him. This happens all the time in wrestling. But apparently in this situation, it's got to be a work. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. How y'all doing? How are you doing? I'm excellent, Brene. I'm excellent. Yep. Uh, very excited that you're able to join us here tonight. Congratulations on retaining the AEW World Championship in such an incredible match with Hangman Adam Page, Swerve Strickland. You guys beat the ever-loving hell out of each other. Should I ask you if you're even remotely surprised that you are still our champion tonight? Not at all. Um, you know, I've always made it a, a point to uh, you know tell the world what I'm going to do, and I think that I've delivered uh, on every uh, promise that I've made here in AEW. Uh, tonight was no different. You know, obviously, Swerve and Hangman, two tremendous young competitors, but they just didn't have enough, and I'm just that much better. So here I am, the champion. All right, guys, the floor is open to you guys. Any uh, questions you guys have for Samoa Joe? It's all you. Take the first one right here, Joe. Thank you for your time, Joe. My name is Jonathan McClarty from flagshipnews.com and militarynews.com. Uh, congratulations on your victory tonight. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Uh, what, do you, what do you think, you know, with Hangman and Swerve, beefing with each other for so long, do you think that served as a distraction to, to further help you to retain tonight? Well, you know, first off, I want to thank your readers for their service. Secondly, um, you know, it was a huge mistake by both those gentlemen. I mean, obviously, they have very, very bad blood between each other. So, you know, these uh, heated issues can often boil over into other parts of their life, unfortunately. It boiled over tonight, which is the worst place for it to happen. So, I mean, if uh, those gentlemen want to stay uh, eyes locked on each other, they thought that the path to salvation was through uh, each other's blood. Well, unfortunately, it wasn't because uh, I made sure that did not happen tonight. So, that's what I feel. Here we go, the Lyric Swinton, SNME Radio. So you talked earlier a couple of weeks ago about bringing back the ranking system as a way to get the best opponents for the AEW World Championship. Today we saw an amazing match, one that you were a part of, and also Will Ospreay and Takeshita. What are your thoughts on the growing, strong talent pool in All Elite Wrestling and what it means to be world champion during this time with so much talent. I mean, it's indicative of what AEW has always stood for. You know, we go out, we find the best wrestlers in the world, and we bring them together to find out who is the best wrestler in the world. Currently, that is me. But on my heels are some of the greatest grapplers to ever step foot in a ring. You know, when we have acquisitions, men like Will Ospreay, how can you not be excited about the future of this company? And, uh, you know, once again, we've set up a protocol. Will Osprey is new here. He's a fantastic, dynamic athlete, has had tremendous success everywhere he's been. But until he has that success here, I don't need to worry about him. Brian Elber is here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Semper, BB, also of WrestlingObserver.com. On another note, mm -hmm. hey, I want to wish the best to Alex Coglin. He wrote on X Saturday, Yeah, I'm retired, and it sucks now. Leave me the F alone. Actually, I have some merch and gear to sell, so don't F off just yet. And that was the entire thing. And uh, 
Obviously, he wants everybody to uh, to leave him alone. So I'll spend like 10 seconds on this. I don't know why he's retiring, but I do know that he's he's had some injuries for quite a while. And so I presume it's injury-related. I don't know anything more. But uh, as of right now, it, it does appear that he's retired. I suppose he could be working everybody, but he has had a lot of injuries. So, I mean, that's all I'll say about it for right now because he wants everyone to leave him alone. That's yeah, if he's got injuries mounting up like that in his early 30s, which I believe that he is. Maybe he's a little younger than that, but, you know, around that age. You know, this is kind of, you're looking at your future. Do I want to be crippled at 40 with not a whole lot in the bank and, and no security if if I start now? We'll see. It's another loss for New Japan, and that's unfortunate because was he as far along as a Clark Connors in the ring or a Gabe Kidd as far as a personality goes? No, but he was valuable. And now they've lost Eddie Thorpe, and they've lost uh, Alex Coughlin. So you you got Connors, you got Gabe Kidd, you have, I guess, Drilla Maloney fits into that as well, too. But again, you know, you, you, you don't want to see that it was unfortunate because he was a guy that could have been some a good tag team partner for a while. And then depending on what they plan on doing with these guys, you know, it, it could be a big loss. Because to me, the way that the Bullet Club was set up with the way that him and Gabe Kidd and that young crew, it looked like they, by the end of the year, could be making some big waves even over, you know, possibly kicking out David Finley. I always thought that was, you know, down the line what was going to happen. So... We'll see what happens here, but all the best to him. And if his injuries have mounted up like that, you know, you know, it's unfortunate, very unfortunate. You know, I would watch his matches, and I just thought, man, this guy, because especially in like the last, and maybe it was injury related, I don't know, but uh, his matches became, he would get in there, and he would try some ridiculous power thing. It wouldn't work once. It wouldn't work twice. And in the end, he would do it, and the place would go absolutely haywire. And I just remember thinking, man, this is like the gimmick of all gimmicks. Because all you have to do is hit one big thing in every match. The crowd eats it up every time. And yeah. the thing with wrestling, you know, in, in any any kind of athletics, you know, you, you're going to lose speed and explosivity. But you'll always have your old man strength. And you'll you'll actually, in some ways, you know... Sometimes you even get stronger. I am much stronger now than I was when I was a youngster. But uh, I was like, man, this guy could do this till he's like 70, you know? Maybe even older. Hey, you know, get a little older, just get a slightly smaller guy and, you know, keep doing your your insane power, your one insane power move. I just always, I always am, uh, I don't wrestle anymore, so I don't care, but I always was really, you know, impressed with, with guys in wrestling that, and actually kind of Randy Orton's sort of like this now too. It's like, you can do nothing. You have one gimmick, and all people want to see is that one gimmick, and you do it at the end, and everybody goes home happy. That's like, that is the ultimate, like, I don't want to say old man, just like smart guy. Way yeah, to work. smart guy. You know? And Randy Orton, Randy Orton is my favorite wrestler in WWE right now. I don't care what anybody says. His matches of late, I just am in awe of this guy. Because he does nothing. And the fans are just eating up everything that he does. And then finally at the end, he does like a couple uber crowd-pleasing things. They lose their minds and it's over. And it's like, God, what a life. I mean, everybody everybody should just watch Randy Orton matches when they're first starting out to figure out how this stuff is done. So anyway... Now, if those people had to pray to a wrestling deity, if they had to get down on a knee and light a candle to someone, would it be Hacksaw Jim Duggan? I mean, he doesn't even have to do any moves, if you think about oh, it. Oh, there's All a million of them. To do, Boogie Woogie home, Man. Honky. All he had to do was just dance. Yeah. He even danced when he was getting beat up. They'd be, they'd be beating him up and he'd still be dancing. And the people would eat it up. And then he'd Dance fire and up and hit like a move and win. He's the best. Amazing. Honky. Oh. <laughs> you know, I <laughs> yes. talked about Honky on the Brian and Benny show last night. You know, Honky Tonk Man, I watched him at the end, you know, when he was doing matches for Tim Flowers. And what this guy did was he showed up 
And he came out, and the place went nuts because the Honky Tonk Man's in Cloverdale, B.C. at the fairgrounds. And he'd ask everyone if they wanted him to sing his song. They'd say yes. He'd start singing his song, you know. Maybe he'd get jumped by the bad guy. People would boo. Tiny little bit of heat. Honky makes a big comeback. And then he goes for the shake, rattle, and roll, and he doesn't even take a bump. He just shake, rattle, and they take the bump, and he stands there. It gets the pin. Actually got down on his knees for the pin, which was amazing. And he just put the foot on the chest. But then he'd ask the people if they wanted to hear him sing a song, they'd say yes. He'd sing a song, they'd go nuts. And then he'd be about to leave and he'd say, you want to hear me sing my song again? They'd go, yeah, and he'd sing it a second time. Then he went in the back and just got envelopes thick, full of cash. It's like, man, this guy's got this thing figured out. Mm -hmm. Good for him. And no one left going, oh, man, what a what a terrible match, you know? Those of us who, who saw him not take a bump for the shake, rattle, and roll, we were impressed. Like, man, that guy didn't even take a bump. And the, the fans were happy as can be. They paid their money and they got all their uh, whatever. So, uh, yeah, that's the way to do it. Becky Lynch hopes that her match against Rhea Ripley will open WrestleMania 40. I'd be trying to get out of there, too. Well, it's not about getting out of there, but oh. uh, it's going back to the old days of Tim Flowers. You know, in the old days, you had you the two best spots on the show were the opener and the main event. And uh, I worked more openers than anybody because Buddy didn't want to work anything except the opener. And uh, the reason the opener is, you know, everyone shows up, they sit down, they're ready for some action, they've got their popcorn, they're all ready to go. And that first match, no matter what you do, they're going to go nuts. And then, obviously, the main event's the main event. So, you know, she's by far, she's far from the only one. You know, MGF's whole gimmick was, I'm either the opener or I'm the main event. Mm -hmm. Every time. And, uh, yeah, the op the first match on night one of WrestleMania 40, that's right. It's a good spot be. to be. Again, this is why you can have world title matches even though it may look ridiculous on the surface if you have two championships you can go ahead and open up a show with that and again you get a hot crowd because unless you're the type of old school booker that will build throughout the card till the end and that's something you absolutely don't have to do with wrestlemania because in theory you're selling this on all of these main event matchups on our biggest show of the year I mean, yeah, I mean, I can't think of a better spot to be in than actually first or last on the show. We've got uh, Collision being preempted Saturday, April 6th. So because of the final four, the <laughs> show's, actually get, the show's actually going to air immediately after WrestleMania. Now, I don't know how many people are going to want to watch more wrestling after four and a half hours of Mania, but no, we shall see. So... Wednesday, March 27th, it'll be a live dynamite, and then Rampage will air on the 29th, but they'll do one back at one, you know, back to back. Quebec City, that's uh, that's this coming Wednesday. Then we've got uh, March 30th, Collision at a taped Rampage in London, Ontario. Collision is live. Wednesday is a live dynamite and a taped Collision. That's ridiculous. That's a long time, by the way. Yeah, to me, it's like, go ahead and run it in the town you were running it in and just run it on tape delay later. I just, I don't know. They're three- and four-hour tapings. I don't know how much feedback they get about it, but it seems like more and more the people that go to those shows, I mean, talk about how cold it is. And, again, you can see that when they do these very long tapings. And we've got, uh, well, we might need a whole segment for Ronda Rousey bearing bents. <laughs> Uh, Great Okan and Tangaloa have chosen stipulations for their upcoming King of Pro Wrestling match. It will be King Fire of Kaiju. What? Yes. Oh, God. Just get out. That's a, it, it, much like a classical Texas death match, the bout will see competitors look to score a pinfall, after which a 10 count will be applied, the last standing being the winner. So, uh, oh, I guess there's two. No, they've chosen stipulations. Well, who? Ch oh, the I see. They've each chosen their. E okay, I got it. I see. Hey, listen. Reading is your friend. They've each chosen. So Khan's idea, or Tangaloa's idea, is the king of kaiju. It's really very simple. It is. And then Khan wants a 
rural revitalization match in Hamamatsu. Oh, come on. If the match that, follows it's... best of three falls rules with the second fall promoting Hamamatsu's local cuisine. What? If you're going to do something like that, do it on the Briscoe's farm or don't. Please, do please vote for that one. I want fall two to be whatever that's going to be. Just fire the whole thing into the sun, please. More after the break. Observer Live. Hey there, Joe. Rick Uccino, CapesideSeats.com. Congratulations on a great performance tonight. Just uh, wanted to get your thoughts on uh, your new number one contender uh, in Wardlow and the words he had this week where he said he was coming for your spot. Yeah, uh, and, and much like everybody else in this in this entire roster. I mean, it's no, it's no surprise Wardlow finds himself where he is. Obviously a very domineering individual that has had tremendous success, admittedly even against me. But uh, right now, this is a very different version of myself. This is not one that is distracted by other championship titles. I'm the AEW World Champion, and Wardlow will, look, will, will soon learn why that is. Hey, Joe, uh, DJ Danny Ocean, 101.9 KISS FM. Um, you mentioned Will Ospreay. We talked about Wardlow. Uh, is there any of these new up-and-coming guys or you got your out that you want to get in the ring with yourself that you want to defend your title against? You know, once again, I, I refer back to championship protocol. I mean, they have to earn this spot. I mean, this is not me up here picking out dream matches, trying to be nice about this. No, this is me uh, supporting the integrity of the championship that only the best grapplers in the world will compete for it. So, uh, you know, is, is there a, a laundry list of wrestlers I'd be more than happy to take on in the ring? Yeah, every single one of them. And you look up and down our roster, you tell me one person that isn't a dream match. I know what this company is capable of. I know about the competitors in this company. And I am more than happy to prove each and every one of them that they're second tier and they're just not on my level. Hey, Joe, uh, Swerve made light of the uh, announcing in a poncho situation. Was mm -hmm. there ever a time in your life that you doubted that you would be back here where you are in this position? No, because obviously I was planning and taking the time to recover so that I could be back here at this capacity competing at this level. You know, far too, too many uh, uh, dumber athletes in this industry uh, don't take the time to heal. You know, don't bet on themselves and say, hey, listen, I'm going to step away from, from things a little bit and I'm going to come back um, uh, not 90 percent, not 80 percent, 110 percent. And I took that time and I came back 110 percent. Now I'm AEW world champion. So, I mean, th this is just indicative of me understanding what I need to do to get things done. You know, I'm, I'm playing this on a very different level than everybody else. Everybody else out here just hoping they get their shot, hoping they're doing things. I'm planning dynasties. And I mean, it starts with it starts with me. And that's not going to change anytime soon. Bro. I mean, they're they're playing chess. They're they're playing checkers. I'm out here playing chess. I mean, this is it's a totally different game, man. And uh, you know that, that that time. I mean, she, doing commentary and punches. I I'm still a millionaire. You know, I know what he's talking about. You know, so I mean, he he may not like that issue, but hey, that that guy on the punch just whipped his ass tonight and is still world champion. So I mean, you, you tell me, you tell me who's running things around here. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. So, I, I couldn't help myself. I got to tell you more about these steps. All right. I'm going to start the whole report over again because I screwed up at the beginning. Both the Great Ocon and Tangaloa have chosen steps for their upcoming King of Pro Wrestling match. Tangaloa would like a King of Kaiju match which is a basically Texas death match. Great Khan, however, said he wants to bring, quote, renewed interest in New Japan events in local areas of Japan before proposing, and I quote, a rural revitalization match in Hamamatsu. So, round one will be under... 10-minute time limit most covers rules. Every pinfall attempt will count as one point in this scenario. Okay? 
So I guess they do a match, and if he pins him five times, he gets five points, and and then that would be really stupid. But so round it's still two, like a Texas death match. Then round two will be an eating contest. The local speciality of eel being the focus for five minutes. They will eat eel for five minutes. I guess maybe you get a point per eel. The chat thinks I'm making this up, but I'm not. Now, is it, is it eel sushi, or is it I don't actual, know. like, you have to eat whole eels? The local speciality of eel is what it says. And then round three, we'll see the two connected via a strap with the winner having to touch all four, ner- four corners. Con- so what? It's tr- so it's what strap- do we even have in the first two falls for? So it's a Texas death match where the falls will count as a point in one round, a eating contest, and then a... Well, I don't even know about points in the second round. Match. It says the first... Well, who, who can eat more eels? Right? Most- I mean, that's how it would work. So we may not even have a third fall? Yeah, it's possible. Okay. Yeah. You know what this is? Stupid. Yeah, it is. So please vote for it. <laughs> so I can start watching some New Japan. I have a feeling it's going to be set up that way, and I'm glad that you need uh, sub-NXT level ridiculousness to get you back into New Japan. I guess Tom's reports are doing it for you uh, coming up later on on Filthy 4 Daily. Yeah, Tom's on today. I don't know what we're going to talk about. SmackDown, I got a bottle of Prime. We're going to do a sponsorship oh. snack down. Oh. We got the greatest. If you guys don't listen to the Filthy Show. Hey, Jared, can we play that song? Did you check? Let's see what he has to say here. Is it legal? We. Oh, man, we can't. Uh. Dang it. Oh, well. It was good for a show. Mm-mm-mm. Well, I guess I got to move on. Is Ronda Rousey. You, wait, if it's because of YouTube you, reasons, you can just mute it out later on. Go ahead and, and put it up right now for the, the people listening over well, That's over a lot of, well, I don't know. if that, I think there might be some profanity in it. I'd have to go oh, back and look. That would be it. Okay, so uh, Ronda Rousey was frustrated. I think we're well aware of that. <laughs> Speaking of profanity. She said, the bloodline is able to plan things out a year ahead of time. They won't even talk to me until I get to the arena about anything. I proved in my first match that if you give me the time, the resources, and preparation, I can put together an amazing match. And I feel they're really doing that with Logan Paul, allowing him to rehearse and put these things together, have all these different resources, producers, to bring him to his highest potential. Got to the point where we girls weren't going to get any of that. She said she began to feel like she was doing custom matches for an effing sicko in the back. (laughs) She said, I just didn't want to be Vince's action figure anymore. There's a lot of profanity I'm editing out here. The the timing of her saying that, too, uh, with what we know about the Vince situation. All power to the girls that keep fighting the good fight, but I'm in my mid-30s now. I've got stuff to do. She does not like Bruce Pritchard. Vince was never gone while I was there. He was just phoning it in through Bruce Pritchard. My agent, who works at WME, he was telling me, you know, he's completely gone now, I swear. It's like, I'll believe it when I see it. Because everyone said he left before and he never left. He was there by text message. So she talked about not having a singles match with Becky Lynch. She said WWE refused to work with her on developing a storyline that would lead to her versus Lynch at Mania 38. WWE just refused to work with me at all. They refused to collaborate. They didn't want to talk to me about it. They kept pushing it off and pushing it off until it finally got to the road to Mania. They're like, yeah, we're not going to do you and Becky. She said, all right, well, I'm effing leaving. Unless me and Shayna can tag. If you guys don't want to work with me, you don't want to do something extraordinary, you just want to do good enough every single night, I came here to have fun with my friends. And then she talked about how she told Triple H she could could not, quote, be associated with mediocrity. That sounds like Rhonda. Yeah. That's why they seem to be happy, or, and that's why they seem to be happy with at the time, mediocrity. I hope that is different now, but I can't say. I've never experienced it any other way. She said, Triple H has been great towards the women in the company, really believing in us. He is the whole reason that I was there, because he believed in me. I really wish my last run was under Triple H running things and Vince being gone. So, she's going to have quite a book. Yeah. She's going to have quite a book. Now, let me ask you a question, and I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this, but Naomi and Sasha Banks walking out of that company, 
with what Rhonda says and knowing how things go, does that give you any pause to think that they, in their minds, were justified in leaving that night? Well, I... With the culture, with what you know about Vince, dealing with Bruce, dealing with a Kevin Dunn, dealing all of that Listen, stuff. Listen, here's what I'm going to say about this, okay? I wasn't there, but this is what I can tell you. There was a period where everything absolutely completely sucked, okay? Started in about, uh, you know, 2018. It was when, when, you know, Becky was catching fire and they decided she should be a heel and the fans just totally turned on the entire thing because it sucked. And the storyline sucked. The booking sucked. You know, they'd announce maybe one match for the following week and they wouldn't do it. Because Vince would just, it was just, it was horrible. Remember they okay? said they had heard everybody well, hold on. and they were going to change? Hold on. That was during that time. Yeah, it sucked. It was terrible. Everybody hated it there. And all I heard from people was how much it sucked and how stupid everything was, okay? When Sasha and Naomi walked out, I did not hear. And these were from people that hated everything and they thought the booking sucked. I did not hear a bunch of people going, they were right. I heard the opposite. I heard of all the things, of all the things. That's why you walked out. If I recall correctly, the idea was, uh, I think uh, Sasha was like supposed to win some tournament or something and get a singles title match on pay-per-view. And... You know, she was upset that, like, they weren't treating the women's titles correctly or whatever it was. All I know is that she did not have the support of the locker room in this situation. They were like, this is not a terrible idea. This is not burying you. This is an angle to get you into a big singles match on pay-per-view. Like, they were baffled. So, yeah, I'm sure it sucked. There was a lot of stuff that sucked. But that was a situation where, where people were like surprise <laughs> like that's why you left you know jingo's like she was oh. gonna lose so what it's a singles title match on pay-per-view people lose singles matches on pay-per-view all the time men women it was also children shoving, shoving the tag titles and her sister to the back seat and i think that probably had something to do with that too and you can laugh about the tag title situation but if you're told we're going to take your storyline seriously we're going to do something with these belts for once and then that's not going to happen and again you push naomi into the back seat who remember they drafted her fourth on raw and then she disappeared for months i mean and again you can say what you want about what you think about naomi or anything but Sometimes it just takes that one last straw to break the camel's back, and there it goes. So, yes, again, I'd listen, like to find out more about that. I'm sure also, that's Brian, what she on, thought. Because also, we didn't hear anybody running to the defense, at least, did we, of Ronda Rousey, or saying that they're getting screwed over in this scenario or this situation where people were running to Ronda's defense. In fact, the only thing I remember from around that time was the fact that fans had started to turn on Ronda. Like, that was the, the big controversy with Ronda Rousey. So it's not like people were going, sneaking information out, saying that Ronda, Ronda's getting screwed here. They're screwing her over. That That's, you know, did we hear that? That didn't, we didn't hear that. So to not hear it about Sasha, I don't know if that necessarily, and again, every situation is different, but I don't know if that necessarily... I'd still like to know what the full story of that was and what actually was going through both her and Naomi's minds. Well, I'm sure she time. was upset that she felt that the tag team titles were being disrespected. But the fact of the matter is, they never did anything with the women's tag team titles. Ever. Even when she won them, they didn't do anything with the WWE no, tag team titles. but that was the whole thing but, was, hey, we are going to do something with this. they were coming off a period where the top star in the entire company was a woman. It was Becky Lynch. And she main evented WrestleMania for the women's title. Like they actually were doing something but what with the singles with women's championship. And so when she said, I don't want to be involved in a match for the singles women's championship, I'm upset that the tag titles are being disrespected. People were like, What? I don't know. When were they ever respected? This where it's like, does it really matter? Okay, if you're taking care of I'm just telling you what people said. Situation. I'm not yeah, taking a side. Okay. I wasn't there. I'm just telling you what I heard just, at the time, which was people okay. were baffled. Guys, remember how stupid that place was? There was a lot of people talking a lot of different things, so. I was, I missed The Rock. 
He wasn't on SmackDown this week. No, no. That was sad. But, you know, they had a pretty good uh, Roman Reigns-Cody back and forth. Yeah, it was all right. And uh, Here's the thing. You can't hit a home run every week because I saw some people kind of, like, blowing it off. But it's like... Well, The Rock wasn't there. Again, not only was The Rock wasn't there, did they recycle the same material that they've been doing? Yes, they did. Was it a long, long pan there and a long hold there as the show was going off the air with everybody standing looking at each other? Yes, it was. But not everything is going to be that awesome every single week and this was more than enough for what it needed to be but i have a feeling next week smackdown will be a little bit more explosive well i uh you know the big question here's actually a great example about how things have changed you all know what would have happened like uh three years ago right roman would have said i promise the bloodline won't be there cody would have agreed to show up without his crew and then the bloodline would have killed him and made him look like an idiot for believing Roman Reigns. That's he, what happened. Because, yes, it was all about heat, and baby faces always look stupid. Okay? Well, here we are. The storyline was that Roman promised he would not bring his guys. And Cody said, all right, I will not bring my guys. And so they did their whole deal. And once the segment was over, Roman snapped his fingers and then got berated by a fan and cracked, which was the funniest part of the entire thing. <laughs> and out comes his crew, and they surround the ring. And it turns out that poor, stupid, naive Cody was not poor, stupid, naive Cody. Because his crew was also there. Because he's not a stupid baby face. And they had the big stare down, and that was the end of that. <laughs> yes, that lady... I can't even say what she said on the air. But Roman is leaving in the aisle, and he's going to do like a big snap to get the his music to play. And right before he snaps, like the crowd's quiet because, you know, they're waiting to see what happens. And this lady, she's got a drink in her hand. She's right next to And she to just him. nonchalantly goes, you need a room full of strangers to acknowledge your little B.A. And there's a pause, and Roman goes, <laughs> and he snaps it. I was dying. I was dying. That lady was a hero. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Corey Lee with the Wrestling Observer. Um, I do want to talk about uh, the main event tonight with uh, Sting's final match. And I just wanted to kind of just get your thoughts on Sting's retirement. Obviously, you had a feud with him in, in TNA uh, over the TNA world title, had a couple great ma you know, great matches with him, and just kind of reflect a little bit about your history with Sting and what he means to this business and this company. You know, I've, 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 I've known Sting as a rival, as a friend, uh, you know, outside the ring as a confidant, somebody who has uh, been a steady and, and, and sobering voice during a lot of chaotic situations throughout my career. Uh, Aside from that, for 40 years, Sting has elicited emotions from crowds around the world that, uh, you know, uh, uh, most wrestlers could only hope they would achieve. And I think that, uh, you know, tonight, how much love he received, how many people showed out for his final appearance, and, uh, you know, how much we here at AEW appreciate his contributions to this company. Um, to be a man like Sting, to have the legacy and the, and the legendary status that you do and still show up here and give that 110% and still try to build a new company and still give of himself physically and mentally at a very high level. Um, you know, it, it, it speaks to his character, it speaks to who he is as a human being, and it speaks to the legacy that he deserves to be celebrated tonight. Two more questions? Uh, Scott Fishman, TV Insider. Um, you know, you being the AEW World Champion, you're seen as the leader, like a face of the company. What are your, what, how would you kind of describe uh, the vibe right now backstage in the locker room and the working relationship that you all have? Um, it's been a turbulent couple months last year, but it seems like things are a little steady right now. So kind of how would you kind of describe the feeling that you have backstage? I, I think you summed it up perfectly. That was last year. I mean, this is the AEW underneath my reign. And... Uh, I, I, as far as uh, our, our locker room committee and stuff, I don't think it's ever been tighter. I don't think it's ever been better. Uh, there's a enthusiasm 
backstage that is infectious and it's because you know we have so much new uh, burgeoning talent we have so many new opportunities to go out there and entertain the crowd with the people that we have uh, at our disposal that um you know there's just there's just genuine excitement among the locker room and uh you know i, I think uh it's been a long time since uh, uh the, this spirit has been felt here and uh, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to uh you know where this leads us in the future Last question for Joe. All right, cowards, cool. All right, I'm good. <laughs> Samoa Joe, our AEW World Champion, everybody. Thank you so much for your time, Joe. Back on the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Simber, BB, also of WrestlingObserver.com. So uh, I was a little behind on the news, as I am sometimes, on Friday before I watched SmackDown. And uh, they were doing Rey Mysterio versus Santos Escobar. And at the end of the match, some dude comes out in a Rey Mysterio mask. And I'm like, that's Dom. And he interfered for the finish. And I was like... Why is Dom on this show randomly feuding with his father again? I was like baffled. And then I, you know, found out later that before the show on social media, the bane of my existence, uh, Nick Aldis announced that nobody from Legato or uh, LWO was allowed at ringside. So that's why Dom showed up because he's not involved in either group. So then I was like, well, where the heck are they going here? So my presumption is they're going to do some sort of tag at WrestleMania. So it'd be uh, Rey Mysterio and maybe Dragon Lee versus Dom. and no, uh, I, Or I Andrade, maybe. Trios match. Could be a because trios. You bring back Carlito for no reason. Come on. Rey, Carlito, and Dragon Lee against Rey, Escobar, and Andrade. That To me, that makes sense. It screws over. Rey, Escobar? You know, uh, Escobar, Andrade, and... and Do or Dom. Dom. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I think that that's where they're going. And then I think uh, maybe even SummerSlam. I don't know, man. Hair versus mask, man. You got to. You got to. Well, you know, there's two guys with long hair in that feud. Dom's guys, mullet is out of control. Two guys with and masks. And Santos has long hair. Uh-huh. It could do. They could do double mask versus double hair. That would be SummerSlam? Huge. Dude, that'd be huge. awesome. Why am I booking this show? I'll be back in an hour with Filthy Tom. It's been real, brothers. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next time, Wrestling Observer Live.